So, um, hi, I'm Robert Priceman, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here. We're going to talk a little bit about the collection. So I've uh, picked out six or seven different pictures, which just give us sort of brief highlight of, um, you know, where we're going with the collection, how we started it, and just, you know, a few anecdotes about it. And, and also to sort of highlight some of the personal relationships we have with, with some of the artists, um, which is... Um, you know, which which is kind of like what what makes it a little bit unique, I suppose, compared to other collections, which are more historic uh, museum collections. Um, so, if we've got, I don't know if we've got the first slide coming up in a moment, uh, which should be a picture of. There we go. So, this this um, this is a picture by Wendy Alia, and it's from her Half Naked series, and it's a painting of um, Judith Jacobs. Judith. Uh, is a well-known British actress and she was um, she starred as Carmel Roberts in the BBC series EastEnders between 1986 and 1989 and uh, she then set up she was co-founder of the Black Theatre Co-op uh, which is a London theatre group of black actresses. Now whilst technically it's a portrait I think it's more of a painting because when a when a portrait painter paints a portrait the, the portrait painter enters the world of the sitter, whereas with this, it's the sitter is entering the world of the artist. Now, I, I was talking to uh, Wendy, the, the, the artist, yesterday about the painting, and I know she, she, she won't mind at all me sharing the stories uh, about how we acquired this painting uh, and, uh, and what it means to us personally. Well, Wendy was one of the very first painters that we worked with, and um when we when we started to set up the collection we we acquired uh, um 20 or 30 paintings initially and and wendy's was one of our first ones but initially she offered us a different painting from her half naked series uh it was a painting of a lesbian activist called red now wendy's series um wanted to look at paintings of the female nude but from a different perspective from a woman's perspective and in a way that wasn't sexualized and she had this painting of red and I thought well that's really striking it's very strong it's very bold it was topless but uh, as I say you know as Wendy was trying to get across wasn't um it wasn't a sexualized image it was quite confrontational and Wendy's quite confrontational herself in a good way I'd say I, I enjoy our conversations and she really challenges the way you think about things uh, and I, I really enjoy our conversation now when we had our first exhibition come up our first display of the collection um Huddersfield Art Gallery offered us a, an opportunity to display and I think by then we've got 50 or 60 works in total and Huddersfield and they're such lovely people and they've got an amazing collection they were the first museum to properly acquire a Francis Bacon painting so this, this Francis Bacon painting had been acquired for the nation but no one actually wanted it and then Huddersfield Art Gallery said they'd taken of course now it's one of the world's most famous paintings it travels all over the world all the time so they've got this brilliant collection of British art and then they offered us an opportunity to show our collection so of course we, we, we just jumped at the opportunity now, as part of that, they wanted to have a, a banner at the front of the building. And I thought, well, you know, they wanted a long, thin banner to, to, to show at the front. And we, we sort of discussed different options and we picked the picture red, which is in the same format as this picture of Judith. And we were all very happy, but, but Grant had to show it to the council to get their approval. Well, because she was topless, they turned it down um, because they didn't want nudity on the building, even though the whole building has got a Greco-Roman frieze of new figures all the way around it. So, so we didn't go with that. But, but then I think, I think what happened is that Wendy got a little bit spooked and she was a bit worried about her painting of red being a little bit controversial. So she, she softened the face of it. She repainted the face of red and she softened it right down. But for me personally, knowing Wendy and knowing that she's quite a sort of strong character, um, it, 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 it kind of diminished the painting. So I said, actually, I've kind of really gone off it, but we worked together and, and, and Wendy offered me this painting of, of Judith instead, which I think has ended up being much, much better for us. So, it, you know, it's, it's a very striking image. Uh, you know, Judith sitting there, she's, she's, she's in a striking, strong pose. She's not, uh, you know, she's not portraying herself, uh, you know, in any kind of vulnerability at all. 
Um, and I think it's, you know, it's very contemporary. Um, and it's, in many senses, it, it, it's kind of like coming to the other side of, of, of art history, when you sort of look at where paintings, portraits started, uh, you know, this is, you know, it's kind of like gone right the other way to, 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 to what it's what is possible to do, in fact, what people are doing now. Um, so if we could move on to the next picture, I'll, I'll then, so, so yeah, so here we've got um, The Golden Mile by Tracy Emman, which is a, a um, uh, which is a, is an etching by 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 her. Um, now, predominantly, what we're interested in is works made by hand, and that's especially given the context because this is a collection that was um, formed in the uh, is all work produced after the year two thousand. So we what we've got is the context of looking at um, the context of looking at how work is made and produced and what it means in the context of the digital age. Um, mostly in our collection, we're looking at paintings. Uh, we're looking at paintings and um, uh, and they're by by artists who are not necessarily always that well known. So we wanted to get some context, um, you know, some some added context of, of getting some artists who are um, you know much better known. So I found this this um, etching by Tracy Emin, um, and it. There's there's quite a few etchings by Tracy. I mean, this one I particularly like. It is it is done by hand in the plate, whereas quite a few of her other etchings were photo etchings. So I thought this this kind of fitted the bill of being drawn by hand. But also I like the fact that it's it's of the seafront at Margate where she grew up. It kind of depicts a kind of childhood vision, and I think it very much plugs into the whole. Uh, you know, there's, there's like when Picasso used to talk about being able to draw and imagine like a child that. It, it has all of those feelings about it and it, it feels like it's a very personal picture so I was really pleased by that to, to have something by Tracy I mean it's really exciting I mean you know we're doing everything on a shoestring budget so so I couldn't I couldn't afford to buy a painting by Tracy I mean but of course you know if she was offering us a painting as a donation we'd be biting her hand off but you know we're not <laughs> we're not in that situation so so to have an etching it feels very special and, and for you know for the artists who perhaps at this stage in their careers haven't like made a name you know having some other artists who who've got a reputation um you know actually that makes quite a big difference and it also makes a difference if we're looking to um put the exhibition on abroad so you know if you're if you're showing work in china or poland or or, or america or wherever you know having a, a bit of name recognition dotted around that actually makes a big big difference for for showing the work abroad so if we can move on to the next uh picture then that's great so this is uh, rock and roll it's by nathan eastwood and he was the winner of the inaugural um, East London Painting Prize. Now Nathan's a working class artist and his all of his work is um, you know is it concentrates focuses on his, his working class sort of culture so he's it's kind of like a gonzo journalist version of, a, of, of what an artist is. So it, it's realism but, but it's documentary realism and if you think about realism in a broad context then realism is you know it's kind of looking at especially with someone like Nathan it's like the harsh reality so so the more kind of pared down the more um yeah I guess more depressive but it's a bit like um black and white social realist films you used to get in Britain that's kind of where Nathan is now this painting in particular it's called rock and roll which is cockney rhyming slang for doll and it's a you know it's a which is it's a government hardship fund um and and this this is um uh, and this is uh, it's a queue of people who are waiting for the for the dole office to, to open up so they can go and get their benefits um so it's, it's quite bleak but what i like about nathan's work is that although he's looking at sort of quite harsh realities of contemporary life he does do them in a very very beautiful way and i think when you have something that's beautiful it acts as a bridge to the subject which you know it really helps you engage with what you're looking at so i think for me you know the handmade and the beautiful are you know kind of fundamental core core issues at, at play so if we could move on to the next slide please that'd be great so so this is a painting by an artist who wishes to remain anonymous and uh, this was put on painting of the day the instagram uh, uh, uh feature uh, in 2019 and it was the most liked painting 
in painting of the day that year. It's a, it is a contemporary painting of the Chapel of St. Peter on the Wall at Bradwell-on-Sea in Essex. And it was built by St. Said uh, sometime after 653 AD. So it's a, it's a very ancient building, but I think it looks quite, quite contemporary in its, uh, in its portrayal. Um, one of the things I find quite interesting about this painting is that uh, Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, used to go there as a child with his family. Now, I don't know if any of you remember, but at the end of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, there's there's the sort of, well, what's the, what's the meaning of life, the universe and everything? And the answer comes back as the number 42. And this building actually is built around the number 42. It's got 42 rafters, it's 42 uh, panes of glass in each of the windows, that sort of thing. So, so there is some speculation that the, the, the building of, uh, of this chapel, which, which, is around, which features around the number 42 very heavily, is kind of what gave Douglas Adams uh, you know, the, 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 idea for, you know, the idea for giving this kind of strange answer to his, his story. So if we can then go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this, this is Circe by Julian Brown. So, so Julian, I think, is, to my mind, he's one of the most interesting painters in Britain today. And, and this, is, this very much sums up why uh, I have a passion for promoting uh, British painting, because I think there are a lot of artists, I think a lot of us in the UK, who, who are super talented, but don't actually have any recognition at all. Now, Julian is very well respected amongst um, painters. And when we've taken his work abroad, I remember the very first time we took his work to China, it was just some very simple line watercolour paintings. And the artists, the Chinese artists who were going around the exhibition, they were looking at Freud and they were looking at Hockney, who, of course, you know, they're all great artists. They were looking at all these other artists that, that were being represented there. They alighted on some some Julian's work, which is so simple. And they just looked at it and they just went, he knows painting. And you think that's it kind of, it's not just yourself who thinks you're getting this kind of proper validation from people who know their stuff. And it's true of artists in Britain. They, they, he's, he's universally admired by other painters. And the reason for that, I think, is that in abstract painting, there are, it, abstract painting roughly falls into kind of three categories. You've got gestural abstraction, which is where the artist's hand is, is shown. You have process-driven abstraction, which is where the paint is allowed to um, do its thing. And then you have constructivist uh, techniques, which is where things are kind of built up. Now, most abstract artists usually work in sort of one of those um, areas of abstract painting, and some will combine two. Junin is the only person that, I'm aware of who combines all three of those features together and does it incredibly successfully and poetically. And I think, so I think he's not only is he kind of technically really very proficient, but he's, um, but he's, uh, he's creating something which is, is, is really quite beautiful and, and powerful, I think. So if we can move on to the next uh, uh, painting, please. Okay, so this is Christine Keeler and her cat by Fionn Wilson. Now, this is a really beautiful uh, painting. And I wanted to talk about this um, as a contrast to the first picture that we were looking at by Wendy Alia. Um, where Wendy's pictures are quite confrontational, I think this painting by Fionn is quite sensitive. Um, Wendy always paints, uh, or until at least the lockdowns, uh, always paints from life. Whereas Fionn, this is a painting made from a photograph, an existing photograph, but she's changed and, uh, and altered it. Um, and I think was well, so one of the things, uh, one of the things that struck me is when, when Jolly first approached me about doing this uh, webinar, um, I, I asked her what, what's kind of one of the key questions uh, that, that you're asked by people. And she said, uh, one, of the, one of the main questions that, that we get asked is, is how many women artists do you have in the collection? And, and it really took me by surprise because um, we've always had more women artists than we have had male artists. And so I thought about that for, for the next few days, what, you know, why that was the case. Because we've, we've, not only have we always had more women artists, we've actually struggled to get uh, enough male artists into the collection. And it's been true when putting on exhibitions that we've, we've always had more women. 
And, and, I th and I think it's because we are a collection which is focused just on the 21st century. And there are, I mean, obviously it's not true historically, but, but now, um, you know, in the 21st century, which we're almost a quarter of the way through, you, you've, you've very definitely got far more women working in the arts than, than, than you have men. So, so things change quite, quite, um, uh, quite significantly. And we, we have in our collection, we have quite a few paintings of women, um, by women and on the whole they're very different you know just i mean you know I, it, I i'm not sure what the kind of um you know philosophies are behind it but 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 just um but just looking uh, you know just observing uh, how the paintings uh, are made women paint seem to paint women in a very different way to the way men used to paint women they, they this is different uh, this is a bit of an outlier from from Fionn because hers is very sensitive. But by and large, I'd say that women paint women um, in, in uh, you know, with quite a harsh eye. So there was a there was a very famous quote by um, Oliver Cromwell when he had his portrait painted, and he said, "I want to be painted warts and all." And actually, when you look at the way men paint, they generally don't tend to paint warts and all; they tend to idealise. But what's interesting purely from an observational point of view, is that actually women do tend to paint warts and all, which I think is, you know, it, it's kind of like a very interesting sort of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something interesting to observe and notice, uh, just as there are more women painters in the collection. And I think, you know, the, these things, they, they emerge because they are a reflection of the time. And it's not something that you're kind of you know, you're not sort of consciously setting out to do one thing or another, but slowly things start to emerge to you and they become kind of reflective of a period or an era. So I think as our collection evolves and we start to see themes uh, uh, and ideas emerging from it, it it's that they're, you know, it's, it's that they're, um, they're revealing themselves to us. So, yeah, as I say, this, you know, I, I, I absolutely love this picture. Um, I mean, Fionn, she's exhibited this a lot and she she put on a, a big exhibition um uh, she put on a big exhibition around christine keeler and she was looking to kind of reevaluate and, and and recontextualize her and it was curating is a very difficult thing to do and i and, and you know it, it was very very hard on fion putting the exhibition on but the, the exhibition got a lot of coverage uh you know it had a lot of support um but I can say, you know, I can see what she went through. I think actually curators themselves who who, who are doing it full time, it you know, it, it really does take it out of me. It's, it's, it's quite a, a difficult um, job to do. But I think I think with this, what what's very interesting is is she's she's managed to capture something of of Christine Keeler herself through a photograph. Where I, I guess what what Fionn has done is put some of her own sensitivity. She's kind of projected her own sensitivity into this photograph and she's bought, she's made something completely new out of something which has previously existed. And I think that's something that artists, you know, when they're working at their very best, that's what they do really well. So, so if we could move to the next uh, slide, please, that'd be great. So this is the last picture that I want to talk about today. Um, and this is by Linda Ingham and it's Easter Cell Portrait with Cocoon. Now, um Linda every year used to do a um used to do a self-portrait and I, I find them very powerful now we, we this was one of the pictures that we took to China um we did a tour of the collection around four museums in China and um one of the uh, one of the leading uh heads of the culture of the um, Jiangsu province wanted to buy this picture, he loved it so much, but it wasn't for sale. I mean, I'm sure I could have made quite a bit of money out of it, but, but that was the point really. The point is to promote the artist, it's not to kind of sell or, or make money out of the out of the collection. But but this, you know, it, it's a very strong and it's a very striking portrait and very like um, Wendy Ailey's picture of Judith, it, it's, it's, it's this kind of warts and all um, image. Now, I find it interesting in a historic context, because if you think right back to kind of the birth of, of painting in the Western world, 
Um, there's a story of Saint Veronica who um, gave Christ a cloth when he was carrying the cross to Calvary. She gave him a cloth to, to, to wipe his face. And, and the story goes that he gave the cloth back and it left an impression of his face on the cloth. So, so in many senses, Saint Veronica is seen as the very first artist. And she is, she is in fact the patron saint of photographers. But that story led to the, um, to the tradition of painting icon pictures, which obviously initially were of, of Christ and then of saints, then that stretched out to include, you know, bishops and popes and, and then people supporting the church, so sort of rich families and then heads of state and that sort of thing. Now you, you, you get to the 21st century and you, you go all the way from sort of heads of state, heads of church to, to, to people painting themselves, to people painting working class uh, uh subjects and and, and so you, you i think what you have is this you, you, this kind of arc of history which now be, before it was very very selective um now it encapsulates everyone and i think that's a really beautiful thing now now thinking for, from my perspective thinking of, of of that history and then thinking of linda's um painting i think it's a it's quite profound so so linda says that she paints these Easter self-portraits because Easter is a time when spring is emerging and life is uh, coming to the fore. And, and she's acknowledging, in her own words, this is not my words, in her own words, that she is a barren woman. So she, she's, she's said very strongly that, you know, she's not able to have children. And that's something that she wishes to kind of explore and mark in her work. So when she has these headbands around, that, uh, around uh, uh, the top of her head, that the headbands, that they're, they're, they're dry, they're brittle. So she's being, you know, she's being very hard on herself. But I think that that kind of harshness that sort of brutal truth if you like actually creates something quite profound for us as an audience to engage and uh, and look at thank you very much for um for listening and it's been a real pleasure to be to be able to to um you know to, to talk to you about to about that about the work and the collection and why we've made it so um yeah thank you very much <laughs>